Welcome to lecture 20, the final lecture of Statistical Rethinking 2022. Today I'm going to give the lecture I probably should have given at the start of the course. This is the constellation Orion. Orion is one of the most prominent constellations in the night sky. It's visible from all parts of the earth and many traditional cultures name it and give it special significance uh, for influencing human affairs. The closest star in the constellation is Bellatrix uh, and she's about 240 light years from us. It's implausible that this constellation influences human affairs in any direct physical way, but it certainly influences human affairs socially because people believe it does. One of the ways it influences us is it's a feature of divination through horoscopes. Uh, there are many traditions of using the stars to portend the events in individuals' lives or in the fates of societies. Here's a very elaborate horoscope that was drawn up for Prince Iskander, grandson of Tamerlane. Uh, these sorts of horoscopes have a very intricate logic that depends upon the positions of the stars at the time of special events like births and weddings and other things. Um, there are many wrong horoscopes, whether you believe in them or not, because it has a logic. And all kinds of fortune-telling traditions have an intricate logic to them. They're not just random stories. Tarot cards, for example, uh, it's not just throwing cards on the table and making up a story. There's a series of draws that happen in a sequence and a logic that spells out from them. Another example, tea leaves, uh, a common form of divination. Uh, the special bowl is used in a way that is relative to time, going clockwise around the bowl. And then there are symbols that people train to recognize in the tea leaves themselves. And so there are definitely wrong ways to read tea leaves, given the logic of the divination system. One final example. Statistics, as it is practiced in the sciences, involves a set of heuristics, a logic, uh, in order to find answers in data. Now, you might think that I'm making fun of statistics when I say this, but I assure you I'm not. The traditions of divination are to be respected, uh, not necessarily because they produce true prophecies, but because they affect people's lives, often in very positive ways, and they evolve intricate scholarship uh, and, and logic, their own internal logics. And so uh, the statistics diagram in the lower right of this slide, um, the fact that it involves rituals, um, which are essentially supported by principles that the users don't understand, like in the case of the constellations, where you need to believe in non-physical forces, uh, to think that Orion influences affairs um, on the earth or in the tarot that um, the, the cards could somehow access the future uh, or the tea leaves. Similarly, uh, when most scientists use statistical heuristics like these branching paths in this diagram to choose little golems, they don't know the principles beneath it. Um, and that doesn't make it bad. Uh, but it does mean that it's very hard to justify what's being done and it creates limitations on what can be what can be essentially well uh, divined uh, prophesized from these procedures so i want to push this parallel a little bit further please indulge me uh, you've indulged me for 19 lectures prior to this one you're used to indulging me uh, fortune telling frameworks have some constraints on them that come from the basic problem that they rely on very modest inputs. So whether we're talking about uh, Tam, uh, the uh, horoscope uh, of Tamerlane's grandson or uh, selecting a t-test from a branching table of statistical heuristics, uh, the inputs are incredibly vague. Uh, they're in vague because in the example of a horoscope, all that's known is the time and position of someone's birth. And from this, we're supposed to chart out the rest of that person's life. 
Um, and in the case of choosing a statistical procedure or test, using only the most um, superficial features of a study in a data set, uh, these are vague facts. And with vague facts, you can, if you want to give advice that is correct, that advice must also be vague. I'll say that again. If the inputs into a logical system, even a correct one, are vague uh, and modest, then if you want to provide correct advice, advice that will either appear to become true in the case of horoscopes or uh, in the case of statistical procedures, uh, that the advice will be valuable, then that advice must remain vague. And that is an essential problem with teaching statistics, not with statistics itself, but with how it's taught, because when we teach statistical courses, we're forced to give essentially horoscopic advice that will apply to the future research problems of the people we're instructing, but we don't know the details of the contexts of research that they will experience in the future. And so we leave out a lot of relevant things that could have helped them. The other thing that's a feature of foreign fortune telling frameworks, including horoscopes and tea leaves and selecting statistical procedures in uh, intro statistical courses, is that there's a tendency to exaggerate the importance uh, of the advice. And the reason is because otherwise no one would listen to it. So in the case of horoscopes or tea leaves, the reading is never that, yeah, there's some vague stuff you might do, but you know, you could just ignore this because who knows. Uh, and in the case of statistical procedures, there's a tendency for the traditions in the sciences to evolve towards stressful danger. Uh, you must check residuals and, and if you select the wrong test, then it's completely invalid and so on. And this leads people to pay attention, which we all like. Uh, we like to, uh, for people to pay attention to us when we give advice. Um, but the importance of these things is quite often exaggerated. And it's exaggerated because from vague facts, you can only have vague advice. If we had a more uh, specialized statistical consulting focused on a particular study, then the advice would be very important, I believe. Uh, but the vague advice usually is not. So these sorts of principles uh, apply to to fortune telling techniques, uh, including uh, astrology and statistics. Uh, but uh, all of these traditions can do better when they have more facts, more details about particular cases. So the vague advice, uh, it, there is val valuable and valid vague advice to be found uh, both in horoscopes uh, and in statistics. Um, in horoscopes, because whether or not you believe the stars influence people's lives, uh, uh, beliefs that are socially transmitted about horoscopes can help people um, to make better plans about their lives and to be happier. And in the case of, of statistics, there are some valid, vague things that can be said. I've said many vague things in this course, and I hope they've been valid. But these things are, uh, the vague advice is not sufficient, um, and I want to emphasize that. One of the reasons it's not sufficient is not just because we can do better when we focus on a particular research context, but because the meaning of our data analysis of our statistical procedures um, requires much more outside of the statistics. One of the things I focused on over and over again in this course is that statistical procedures acquire their meaning from models outside of the procedure, from the scientific models that motivate them or should motivate them. Now, I focused on this in the context of causal interpretation. Uh, that is that the, the classical battle between Bayes and frequentism is largely irrelevant to the problems that scientists face when trying to extract meaning from data. Uh, causal inference is the more important thing to deal with. But there are other things as well, other than just having causal models that affect the kinds of research that we deal with and cope with and the meaning of statistical procedures as they appear in the research literature. What all these things have in common, I'll talk about them in a moment, is that uh, uh, they are highly subjective. That is, causal models are highly subjective, by which I mean they depend upon expert opinion, individual expert opinion. They depend upon the person. Um, uh, statistical procedures are, are nice and convenient to focus on because they can be made objective. Uh, the computer will run them the same for everybody. 
Um, and if we have a rigid set of rules, like in that traditional table, then everybody will use them in the same context, at least approximately. But most of the features of research, whether it's in academia or in industry, are highly subjective and must be, because all subjective means is that people differ in their opinions. All objective means is that we all agree. It has no, nothing to do with the truth of it. Subjective opinions can be correct and objective opinions can be wrong. And there are in research, there are many subjective responsibilities. And we're gonna spend this lecture talking about them and how they affect the conduct of statistics and how we should understand results that we see in the scientific literature. This is the typical scientific laboratory. Now, obviously this is a bit of a joke, not a good joke, I know, but uh, this is a messy alchem alchemical laboratory. Uh, but I've seen laboratories that look kind of like this. Uh, they really need of cleaning. None of the reagents are in the right place. Uh, someone brought their dog. Um, there are grad students in the back having beers. Uh, it's not impossible to see uh, our own academic work in a scene like this. Uh, and I don't want to say that this is necessarily bad, but what I want to emphasize is that a lot of the daily practice of science is pretty sloppy. Uh, and this, this has a huge effect on the quality of the results that we get. Often when we talk about statistics, we focus on the part that can be made, at least apparently, objective, and that is the quality of the data analysis. And this course, like all others, has really focused on that uh, to a huge extent. Uh, I've talked about causal models a lot, yes, um, uh, and occasionally about ethical responsibility in reporting statistics, uh, but for the most part I focused on algorithms which can be made objective uh, um, and uh, justifiable logical reasons for choosing statistical procedures given a causal model. So again, the appearance of objectivity. But there are all these other things that are equally important but cannot easily be made to seem objective. And I think that's one of the reasons we don't talk about them. Uh, the first, of course, is the quality of theory. Theories are inherently subjective things. Um, of course, they're tied to empiricism, uh, but individuals differ in the kinds of causal explanations they come up with, and then we must go find data for them. The quality of the data as well. Uh, is another issue that has to do with subjectivity. It's tied to causal models inherently because there's no other way we can talk about what quality is supposed to mean for data unless we think it's for something. Uh, and all the issues of measurement that go into this as well. Uh, the reliability of our procedures and our code. People make mistakes uh, and uh, when they code things. I have done so myself and this is just as important as designing the model originally is to have some way of working which makes the code safe and reliable so that others will trust that it functions as intended. Documentation, of course, is very important and we all know as scholars, uh, whether we're in academia or in industry, uh, that we're supposed to document what we do, but many of us, including myself, often fail to do so. And finally, how we report what we've done to others. Uh, uh, the procedures, the methods, uh, and the results have a big effect on the consequences of our analysis. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you some horoscopic advice about these other elements in the typical scientific laboratory. And I'm going to do it in three parts. Uh, the first part I'm going to call planning. This is subjective responsibilities in research that have to do with the design and planning of studies. The second is the more detailed sorts of ways that we really work with data analysis, uh, the things that surround running the statistical model but are just as important. And then the third is how we report what we do, uh, how we um, lead our colleagues in comparisons, uh, provide materials, and the like. All of the elements of planning a research project are equally important because each multiplies the possibilities of the others. I'm going to go through just a selection of the aspects of planning to highlight some principles which I think are important. Uh, you or someone else could make another list and those uh, 
Elements of the other list could be equally important, uh, but this is my list. I'm going to talk about goals. Uh, what are we trying to do in the first place? It's important to be explicit about that. And then talk about theory and the things the theory does for us in terms of justifying how we acquire the data and how we analyze it. Uh, and then the ethical responsibilities to document um, and make shareable our results. So goals. Uh, in this course, I've spoken a lot about estimands, the thing that we're trying to estimate. Uh, goals are a bit broader than just quantitative estimands, of course. I don't mean to fetishize quantitative data analysis, uh, but this is a statistics course, so I'll um, uh, constrain my comments to quantitative analyses for the moment. Uh, on the right here, I have a sort of cartoon version of the relationship between what we're trying to estimate, that is the estimand, uh, shown there at the top right, the porcupine cake, uh, and then there's some method we're going to use to estimate it, that's the estimator in this metaphor, it's a recipe, and then we end up with an estimate, which is inevitably uh, not exactly what we were after in the first place, but hopefully uh, uh, resembles the estimand enough to be of use. It's important to be clear uh, in the beginning of a, of a project what exactly we're, is, we're trying to estimate because if you put this step at the end after you've done the data analysis, you can get almost any answer you want uh, and that's not good for anybody. Once we have an estimate stated in general terms, uh, we actually need to say um, which assumptions are we going to make which are going to make it possible for us to have a way to have, construct an estimator. Now, and uh, the metaphor, the recipe uh, metaphor breaks down a little bit here, but you can think about this as being the constraints on ingredients uh, that we'll be able to use and the equipment that you have available. But really, inside of a research project, this is where we make our causal model, our scientific theory. And the estimate must be identified inside of that causal model in order for us to justify any statistical analysis, which we'll do with it. And that's been the case in the majority of the examples in this course. But let's think a little bit more about that, because what I haven't said a lot about in this course is where theories come from. Uh, and I don't have enough time in this lecture to really do justice to that question. It's a craft in and of itself, the construction and inspection of scientific models. Uh, but it may be useful just to give you a crude taxonomy and say some things uh, a few more things about uh, the heuristic causal models that we've used in this course. So I, I tend to think about there being uh, four main levels of theory building, and none of them is better than any of the others. Uh, they're complementary because they zoom in and out at different levels of detail, different effective scales, and help us understand and develop intuitions in different ways. But all of them are analytical, and that's what makes them logical theories. That is, they all uh, specify or imply algebraic systems which can be analyzed for their implications. The first of these is the heuristic causal models or, or directed acyclic graphs that I've used in many of the examples in this course. Uh, at this level, really all we have is a set of variables, which are potential causes, and arrows coming from them indicating influences. But this is a lot. Uh, because what the DAGs allow us to do is um, say, if we're not willing to assume anything specifically about these influences, these arrows, uh, what can we deduce uh, anyway? And the answer is a lot, as you've seen. Uh, the second level are structural causal models. That's every time we've done a synthetic data simulation in this course, we've produced a structural causal model, that is a DAG plus some set of specific functions, that identify the influences in precise mathematical ways. Uh, even more can be deduced in these cases because there are many cases in which the DAG cannot decide if there's a way to produce an estimate, uh, estimator for our estimand. Uh, but once we have made structural assumptions, uh, often we can. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, monotonicity is a very powerful assumption that often al allows identification. Um, and so lots of analysts are willing to make that, and it's often scientifically reasonable. 
The third are full dynamic models, uh, like the uh, ordinary differential equation models that I've copied on the slide that you met in the previous lecture, in lecture 19. Um, many scientific theories involve dynamical systems equations, and these sorts of models have lots of implications, seen at different scales and in different variables and at uh, uh, different spatial and temporal resolutions. And then finally, I think about agent-based models as being um, one of the most fine-grained ways to construct a theory. Dynamical systems models tend to average over some collectives. Uh, they, they think about rates and, and uh, zoom out uh, at some level of detail. Agent-based models um, model every uh, decision-making entity uh, by itself. Uh, they can't be analyzed analytically, at least not usually, although there are some tricks. Uh, but they are a very powerful way uh, to see the implications of assumptions in complex systems. All four of these approaches uh, are worth practicing together, although not every project, of course, requires them all. Uh, but you have to have some level of theory building in any project. Now the question is, where do these models come from? How do you learn to make them? Uh, there's no easy answer to that except to read models. Uh, I'll say that again. I think the best way to learn to write models is to read models. And uh, you, you develop an understanding of their grammar and uh, their vocabulary. Uh, and uh, in this linguistic metaphor, eventually you become fluent. Uh, but it takes time and you have to be patient. Let's say a little bit more about the DAGs here. Uh, so there are some uh, heuristics for heuristic model building. And uh, uh, this is not a complete uh, list here, but I want to give you a short list of a way you can proceed to uh, build a DAG for some particular analytical problem in the simplest cases. This is only a starting place, uh, and you will need iterations and to show your results to colleagues, but this is a good start, I think. It, it's been great when I do consultations and I'm working with scientists and I'm trying to uh, elicit from them their latent causal models because all scientists, in my experience, have um, well-informed latent causal models about the systems they study. They just need some nudging to make it formal. So there's an order in which I tend to go. Uh, the first is to think about, well, let's have a clear statement of the estimate, that is, the treatment and the outcome. So you can just draw the treatment and the outcome, and I'm going to use the, the UC Berkeley admissions example from earlier in the course as an example here, but I think you'll see the abstract structure. So uh, here G influences A, the gender of an application influences its probability of admission. Um, and then we build things around it. So first we think about other causes of the outcome. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, the department also influences uh, the chance of admission because departments vary in the numbers of slots that they have relative to the number of applications they receive. And then there are other effects. Uh, that is that there may be influences on variables other than the outcome. Uh, so in this case, uh, gender probably also influences the department uh, because uh, male and female applications are sorted into different departments because people send them there. Uh, this is a simpler sort of DAG we could see. There could also be relationships with other variables um, uh, in the DAG as well, and you'd think about those in terms of other causes and other effects. Uh, but there are also things which are unmeasured that are worth thinking about. And so uh, you should consider all the pairs of variables and whether there may be um, uh, hidden confounds, that is, unobserved common causes among them. Uh, so in this triangular DAG on the right but with G, D, and A, uh, there are three pairs of variables, and each of them could have an unobserved common cause. Um, but only one of them is actually scientifically plausible, and it's the one that links uh, department with um, admissions and uh, what could this unobserved common cause be? Well, if you remember that lecture, I argued that um, one likely unobserved common influence on admissions chances and department choice is the ability of the applicant, uh, and that leads them to sort in other ways. Um, but even if you haven't identified it, it's worth worrying about these things. Uh, why aren't the other combinations, that is, why, why should, have I excluded some unobserved common influence on, say, gender in applications. Uh, because gender is not something that is influenced by something in this system at time of admission. 
uh, that would also influence application, right? We're, we're, we're viewing gender as fixed in this particular model. Uh, so it's the identity of the variables like that that helps you structure these models. It's your scientific knowledge always of what the variables represent that helps you decide which errors are reasonable and exclude others. Because if you can't use that information, then there are a huge number of possible DAGs that arise from simply flipping the directions of arrows, but most of them are scientifically nonsense. Okay, Let, let's come back to the porcupine uh, and move through uh, the list here. So once you have a, uh, a scientific model, whether it's a DAG or something more detailed, uh, you can use that to inform your sampling plan. You can write a synthetic um, uh, data uh, a generating engine and you can sample from it uh, and you can decide uh, how, how much data you need and so on uh, because you will also have justified an analysis plan using uh, the techniques that I've showed you in this course, things like the backdoor criterion, uh, to try out the analysis on your synthetic data because you have a generative model now um, and you can decide how much data you need, in which units, um, how balanced, and so on. As important as it is to get all of the first four steps in this list correct, if you don't document it, chances are it won't be worth very much. Uh, other people need to know what you did so that they trust it, and you will probably need to reference exactly what you did in the future because you will want to do it again, or you will want someone else to be able to build on your work. So documentation is important, and you should be documenting at every step as you go and not at the end because it will be too hard at the end. You won't remember if you're a normal person, exactly what you did at each step. One of the uh, luxuries that comes from scripting uh, your analyses and writing code to do these steps is that to some extent, some minimal extent, it's self-documenting. But we can do much better by putting additional comments. Uh, often we need more comments than there is code. So we understand the intention of each particular block of code and that'll help us uh, future us when we want to look back at our own code and reuse it and it'll help your colleagues because they'll understand what you did and understand the reasons for it. Finally, I think it's equally important to point out that it's really not okay to use proprietary data analysis software anymore. Uh, I guess if you're in industry there may be legal reasons that you need to and I understand those constraints, uh, but certainly for academics, uh, people doing basic research especially, you should, there's, the best statistics software is free and open. Um, and uh, if you want people to be able to use your code and inspect your analysis, they need to be able to run your code. So uh, using some expensive proprietary data analysis stack uh, like Stata to single something out um, is not really ethical, I'm afraid. And I know that sounds like a harsh opinion, but it is my opinion. It's not ethical because the point of doing science is that what we do can be inspected by our colleagues and your colleagues in many parts of the world cannot, inf cannot afford Stata, but they can afford R because it's free. Same goes for data formats. If people can't open your data, uh, then they can't use it and they can't trust what you did. Uh, but that's, there's lots of open data formats, comma separated formats are perfectly fine. Um, your future self will also thank you for using open formats and open software because you may not have access to the proprietary software that you used in the past when you switch jobs or institutions. And many of my colleagues who have in the past used proprietary data formats have found themselves unable to open their own data uh, at some point in the future. Okay, last thing I want to say in this section about planning is uh, to say a little bit about pre-registration. Some of you have heard of this. Uh, pre-registration is uh, a kind of scientific documentation, research documentation, in which we uh, write up and publicly distribute uh, prior documentation of our design and our analysis plan. This is before the data have been collected or at least before they've been inspected in any detailed way. Uh, and it's meant to draw um, a, a clear epistemological line, or I should say epistemic line, uh, 
uh, between um, the decisions about design and analysis uh, which we've made in the absence of the data. Uh, so let me say that more eloquently. The, the, the problem is that many um, research design decisions and aspects of scientific analyses are made with detailed knowledge of the data itself. They're data dependent. People are choosing um, uh, methods of statistical analysis and data processing, um, which are uh, conditional on the particular sample they have in possession. And this is very dangerous for inference. Uh, the, it, it tends to increase um, false results uh, because if you really believe in your hypothesis, you will process the data, uh, transform it, for example, um, in particular ways, and analyze it in particular ways to maximize the statistical power that you have. And maybe that sounds good. We like statistical power. The problem is when you're doing that, you're implicitly conditioning on the idea that you're correct, that your hypothesis is correct. And when you maximize power, you're also increasing uh, the rate of false positives. Um, and so then if your hypothesis is wrong, you're increasing the chance that you'll conclude it's right anyway. Uh, so if you want to think about this in a more transparent way, think of it this way. Um, suppose you were uh, the world's best scientist and you always propose correct hypotheses, uh, and this was known. Well, then in that case, um, it would be reasonable for you to do whatever you could during data processing and statistical steps to find the effect you believe in because your beliefs are always correct. And that's what I mean by data-dependent um, transformations and analysis. Uh, the problem, of course, is that nobody's like that, and we propose lots of false hypotheses. Um, the history of science demonstrates that almost all hypotheses are false. And, uh, uh, but some are true and we need to have methods that balance the risks of false discoveries um, and, and finding the real ones, or, or missing the real ones, I should say. Okay, so pre-registration is, is, is a, a epistemological tool to draw an epistemic line between the decisions we made prior to looking at the sample and the decisions we make afterwards. But it doesn't constrain you to change the analysis afterwards because often there are good reasons once you've seen the data to change your mind. It's just important that those decisions be transparent because they have very different importance. Now, the pre-registration's good. I have nothing against it. I've done it myself. Um, however, it doesn't address what I think of as the most pressing problem in uh, data analysis in the sciences, and that is that people can't justify their analysis at all. Uh, so the fact that they've justified it prior to seeing the sample does nothing to improve my opinion of it, to be honest. It does little to improve data analysis. And lots of pre-registrations are just typical causal salad, uh, and what was really needed here is theory that constrains the ways that we decide which analysis we're going to do. Uh, and, Theory used through tools like the Do Calculus and Backdoor Criterion um, to uh, lead to statistical analyses, which can credibly get us the estimates we want. Okay, let's talk about the details now. The thing about uh, data analysis is that uh, when you're doing it, there's a lot of scaffolding involved. Lots of little bits and jumps and starts and movements forward and back. Um, and by the end of the project, you bring the scaffolding down and you present the results. Uh, but Jesus wasn't built in a day. And we all know that there's a lot of skill involved in simply uh, putting this thing up in the first place, even though once it's finally up, you can't see how it was done. So I want to talk a little bit more about that, about the scaffolding that goes into the actual work. And I've showed you a little bit of that in this course, but I think I could still give you a few more hints that are useful to horoscopic advice. Um, and I'm going to uh, focus on four things. That is uh, how we control our work in the project. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, the incremental testing that we need to do as we go, as we put up uh, the statue, uh, the documentation, and what would that look like? Uh, 
Uh, and then review. And I don't mean peer review here in the traditional way. Just bear with me. Um, so for the meme on the right of this slide, what I'm, I'm trying to get across to stick in your memory is that uh, scientific data analysis, scientific research is often quite chaotic uh, and, and we can do a lot better. That is, we, we should be drawing the owl in a professional, incredible way that we wouldn't be embarrassed to explain to our colleagues. Um, now, in this course, I've, I've sketched out a number of times this basic four-step uh, way of working, this kind of workflow where we, at the beginning we express our theory as a probabilistic program. What does that mean? When we wrote a synthetic data simulation, that's a probabilistic program. Uh, and then the second step, we prove uh, using logic, uh, or just algebra, which is a kind of logic, that the planned analysis could work conditionally. Yeah, that is, we, we have uh, the planned analysis and we have synthetic data, so we can show in some sense uh, uh, that it would work conditionally if our assumptions were true. And then third, uh, so we, we test the whole pipeline on synthetic data, that is data processing and everything else that comes out of the synthetic simulation. Um, we have our estimand and we have uh, at by step three also working code. And then finally in four, we run the pipeline on the actual empirical data. Uh, there may be new adjustments here because there are things about the real sample you hadn't anticipated, but that's okay. You've documented this, the history is open. Uh, you can rewind a bit and fix the steps and come back in. Um, having this history be open and saved uh, gives you credibility. Um, it you helps you work in a way that you wouldn't be embarrassed uh, to report to the public. And that's very important in a publicly funded profession like the sciences. So you can tell what I'm getting at here is that a typical way that scientists work is too often as if it were some kind of hobby uh, rather than a profession. Um, and data are often processed, uh, not to mention collected, in fairly reckless ways. Uh, that say that there's a dangerous lack of professional norms in many uh, of the subfields of the sciences, and particularly in scientific computing. Um, it's often impossible to figure out exactly how data were processed or exactly which statistical models were run. And it's often also impossible to know if the code works as it was intended to work because it's never been tested in any serious way. Um, so there used to be a time in the laboratory sciences. I suppose there still are laboratories which are, are fairly sloppy on safety, but uh, in general, the laboratory sciences have stronger norms about safe conduct. So many of you will know what a pipette is. A pipette is uh, used to transfer liquids um, and samples uh, and uh, you'll see the gentleman on the right there in the old photograph. It's got a pipette in his mouth, and he's uh, drawing some liquid into it using suction from his mouth. And this used to be a, a common way to make this work. Um, uh, do not do this. It's very dangerous because you could end up with some of the solution in your mouth, and this is a bad idea. Uh, and uh, if you're not concerned about your own safety, you have to be concerned about the purity of the sample because, of course, things come out of your mouth into the pipette as well. So no pipetting by mouth. Now, many of the casual self-informed habits of scientific computing are the metaphorical equivalent of pipetting by mouth, and we must stop doing them. How do we do that? Well, uh, again, uh, the laboratory sciences um, uh, have gone through revisions here, as has software development, and we can take cues from both of those areas. So as I said, there was a time when pipetting by mouth was considered fine. People did it all the time. But many laboratory cultures have developed uh, into uh, management protocols where uh, there's sample registration and workflows and databases that are used to track all the work in the lab so that they, can, they know exactly who did what when. Um, and this is a, a kind of control, workflow control, that I call versioning. The same thing goes on in software engineering for large um, uh, computer science projects where even if there's only one programmer, but especially if there are multiple programmers working on the same project, uh, you need to use some sort of versioning 
uh, version control. And version control is a great way to have both backup of your work and accountability. I'll say some more about this in the next slides. Uh, at the same time, we want to build up complex projects one piece at a time. And I hope I've convinced you in this course that even the simplest sort of statistical analyses can be complex in their details. Uh, you have uh, pieces of the workflow that proceed in some sequence. Think about my one, two, three, four, drawing the owl uh, sort of idea. And you should be testing each of these incrementally so that you don't get to some later point and find it doesn't work, and then not be sure what thing upstream is broken. If you test each step before moving on, uh, it makes work much easier and it gives you much more assurance, both for yourself and for your colleagues, that, is, that your analysis is actually working as intended. Um, let me talk about these first two things, uh, but uh, the last two on this slide, I'm not gonna say much more about. I'll just say with documentation, you really should be commenting everything uh, that you do, because you may not remember, even in a few months, exactly why you wrote the code you did. Um, and then for code review at the bottom, the code and materials, uh, you could adopt this principle from business called the four eyes principle. And that is the idea that at least two people should take a look at every piece of your research project. And so if you're doing your project by yourself, that's, that's quite rare in the sciences these days, but if you are, you can get into a reciprocal four eyes arrangement with a colleague who also needs the same service from you. And this can be very minimal. You simply take a glance at their analysis code and tell them whether you think it's sufficiently commented, for example, or have them explain it to you. And this often magically uncovers problems in the code that can then be fixed before they do damage. But let me take a talk about the first two much more because there's a lot to say about this. And I wanna give you some examples. So version control. What version control is, is, is a database of changes to your code and your data files and even your documentation. It's a managed history of your scientific project. You don't overwrite anything, you merely update it and all the changes and when they happened and who made them are stored in the version control database. The most common of these is this architecture called Git, G-I-T, shown in the upper right of the slide, which is a piece of open source software that manages such a database. You probably already have it on your computer. Uh, but if you don't, you can use it through the website GitHub, which makes it uh, quite accessible, just entirely drag and drop, in fact, through the browser. Um, at the same time, uh, what's the alternative, I should say? What's the alternative to version control? The alternative is this clumsy habit that many people fall into naturally because their computer leads them into this danger, dangerous path of duplicating files and modifying them. And then you end up with project folders full of a bunch of copies of your data and your code, and you can't tell which is which. Uh, this is a very bad situation to be in. Testing is equally important and, and goes hand in hand with version control. What you should be doing is setting a, a set of milestones for the development of your project, both its code and the data processing. And you should be testing each of these milestones before moving on to the next. Uh, I'll say some more about that. <clears throat> so, uh, if you've been taking this course, then I think you uh, have visited or should visit the course website, which I maintain on GitHub. I show a screenshot of it here. And this is a version control database uh, of the course files and links. Um, and uh, it really is not necessary for a project like this, but uh, I just use this as an example to familiarize students with, with version control and, and Git. One of the things that happens from this is that um, the whole history of my maintenance of the course website is public and you can go look at it on the website. And I'm showing you at the top part of this slide, all of the commits. Uh, commit is a set of changes that I have chosen to timestamp and mark. Uh, this is up to you. And these are the milestones uh, of the project of maintaining the course. And you'll see that the first commit was on October 3rd of uh, 2021. That's when I made the course website. The course began in January. You can see that starting in January there, um, lots more commits begin in a steady stream uh, until March, uh, now where the, when the course is ending. <clears throat> 
Uh, and for each one of these commits, you can look in the database and see exactly what was changed. For example, at the bottom, I'm showing you one of the most recent commits where I simply added the links for lecture 19 for the uh, recording and the slides. For code projects, of course, it would show exactly what code you changed uh, and who did it. Um, most researchers don't need all of Git's features. Git can do a lot of things. You can manage multiple uh, branches of your project and then merge them back together. It handles multiple users. It, it, it's very fancy. Uh, but most researchers don't need all that. What you do need to do is develop your list of milestones and commit changes after each milestone and maintain the test code as part of the database as well. Uh, so you can run the tests, all of the tests, after each milestone. I'll say that again. You maintain the test code as part of the project uh, because after each milestone you want to run all the tests again uh, because sometimes uh, uh, gremlins appear and affect things uh, in the previous parts. But if you're running the tests, you'll have that sense of security that your code functions. Um, there are also things you, you should not do uh, and, and Git helps us avoid doing these things. You should not replace raw data with process data. The whole idea is that you use code to process data and you maintain that in the version control. And so you can always repeat all the steps in the data analysis and show them to your colleagues and question whether that was the right thing to do and do it another way if necessary. If you overwrite raw data with process data, which people do, for example, when they work in spreadsheets, uh, you could get into, into trouble real fast because you won't know what was processed and what was measured. I want to say a little bit more about testing and what these mysterious milestones are. I just want to give you uh, uh, an example to reference. So uh, the idea is that a complex analysis needs to be built in steps. So all of lecture 15 was intended as an example of something like this. And to remind you, lecture 15 was a social networks lecture. And in that lecture, we um, drew the conceptual model, the DAG, very early in the lecture. And we had our estimate very early. And, uh, and therefore a design of the eventual statistical model. But the statistical model was fairly complicated. It had two uh, rather different kinds of covariance matrices in it, um, and there was lots to explain and test. And so I built it up incrementally. Um, and just to remind you of those steps, and you can go back and rewatch this lecture, maybe at double speed if you like, or just flip through the slides. The first milestone in that lecture was this, the synthetic data simulation. We needed some data to test the statistical model with. And the process of writing that synthetic data simulation also served to debug our thinking about the causal model. The second milestone is the dyadic reciprocity model. Uh, this was not going to give us our estimate because we knew it was a confounded model. Um, but it was the first step we needed to develop, the first bit of the golem we needed uh, to engineer. And then we tested uh, that dyadic model on synthetic data. The third milestone was to add generalized giving and receiving, that is to deal with the confounds by stratifying by generalized giving and receiving, and then we tested that on synthetic data. And then finally, we added explanatory variables, uh, that is wealth and association index, um, and then we tested that as well. For really big software projects like STAN itself, the STAN math library is the heart of STAN, it's the part that uh, does the calculus for you. And uh, this is a big project, um, uh, by scientific standards at least. And in projects like this, there's typically more testing code than there is actual library code. So if you go look at the Stan Math Library, at least at the time I'm, I'm recording this lecture, there are about five megabytes of library code that does the, that gets compiled down and, and then executed when you use a Stan model. But there uh, is another folder for tests, and it's over 8 megabytes in size. Uh, and, and the STAN team spends all this time writing test code because they want to be sure that it, this uh, code works, uh, because otherwise uh, it will not only be bad for them, it'll be bad for the rest of us. Uh, likewise, my rethinking package also has a bunch of test code. There's a test folder. You can look at it. And every time I'm about to make a change and publish it, uh, I run the whole test folder and essentially tests the whole course and makes sure that, make sure that all the examples and some additional examples um, work as intended. But for 
cases where we're doing smaller projects, just developing data analysis pipelines, uh, you don't need all that, uh, but you still do need some testing. And so here's a minimal example from one of my own analyses. Here's a little bit of consulting I did for a professional society where I developed uh, a model to help uh, rank uh, conference presentations. Um, and uh, it's an ordered uh, logit kind of model. Uh, and uh, it, this is a public repository. You can find, the, find it on GitHub uh, under my GitHub account as CES Raider 2021. Uh, what are the pieces in this repository? So uh, the first thing here, there's a documentation folder where if you look in there, you'll find um, a, a nice pretty LaTeX document that has the mathematical version of the model and its justification and also uh, reports of the testing uh, that, that are done by the code to follow. Uh, then the second line here, the simulation code. This is the synthetic data simulation uh, that I use to test the model and validate it. Um, the next uh, file down, the validation code, uses data produced by the simulation code to uh, show that the statistical models function as intended. And then there's the production code, which is the analysis code that is actually used to produce a report on real data. Um, and then you'll see there's other materials in here. There's uh, uh, anonymized data, uh, which can be shared, which has all the actual names of the presentations and presenters removed. Um, and then a, a template data that, that was simply used to explain what the data should look like. Uh, and then the stand models themselves. And I have two saved here. Your project may have more, you may have uh, only one, um, but this reflects the way in which I build statistical analyses. I typically start with the simplest version of the model I can, which only has a few of the pieces which I um, intend to originally have in the, to eventually have in the full model, uh, and then more complex versions all the way up. And I've tested each of these on the synthetic data. I think this is in a, in a sense the kind of minimal image of a data analysis project that you want to have in mind. Uh, and the kind of minimal uh, project folder uh, that you might use, although the details and organization might differ. How are you supposed to learn all this? It's one thing to see screenshots and be told there's this mystical thing called Git. Uh, well, you're in luck because there are lots of really good materials online uh, for learning how to do this. Uh, these tools are in use constantly in the sciences and in industry, and um, you can learn them. Uh, uh, online by watching videos and taking uh, self-tests and, and so on. And it's, and it's for the most part free. Uh, the best materials I know are from the Data Carpentry series. Uh, and you should go to their website, uh, just Google Data Carpentry, and you will find lots of really good uh, materials there, uh, as well as a potential to uh, sign up for workshops if you're interested in those things, or host your own. Uh, so for example, you go to datacarpentry.org and you look uh, under materials for ecologists. I know a number of the people who watch my course are ecologists and I'm always thinking about your needs. Um, you'll find lots of things tailored to you which will help you organize your data and process it, uh, do visualization uh, and, and, and so on. And all of these skills are things that uh, if you spend a little bit of time now learning them, they'll serve you for the rest of your career, wherever that may take you, whether it's uh, into or out of industry uh, or back and forth, as, as many of my colleagues do now. Okay, one last thing in this section that I wanna say. Um, so the, people make jokes about Excel all the time. I know I do, because it's a funny piece of software. It's also really powerful. Um, there's a, one of the funny stories about Excel uh, is this story from a couple of years ago where uh, various genes, uh, the names of genes, so genes in the human genome are given names, so, uh, monikers that allow us to reference them and link papers that, you, that refer to them and so on. Well, um, a few years ago, uh, it was decided uh, that uh, some of the genes would have their official names changed. And the reason is because Excel was mangling the names and uh, Microsoft had no interest in fixing this behavior and it was messing up science. So various audits had found that uh, um, a fifth of genetic data in papers uh, had errors that were introduced by Excel. How does this happen? Well, you may have heard that Excel likes to convert things into dates. It has this little pushy artificial intelligence in it, which looks at everything you type 
and tries to guess what format it should be in. Uh, it's very difficult to turn this off. And um, uh, it tends to turn a large number of gene names into dates. And this completely erases the raw data that was typed in. It's gone forever. Uh, and uh, then people would do their analyses, get the wrong results, and then even publish the raw data that had been mangled by Excel. And that's how these uh, audits find this rate of a fifth. Um, this is a serious problem. Yeah, if, if I told you there was a scientific literature in which a fifth of the papers simply had invalid data that was produced by poor data processing, that would not give you confidence in it. Okay, um, people have been complaining about this behavior for a long time. It's been known about for decades, uh, but Microsoft has no interest in the academic sector, I don't think. That's not where their money's coming from. And this is a minor use, uh, wasn't worth their time. So instead what happens is the Human Gene Nomenclature Committee decided to rename the genes that were affected. Uh, and that's, that's what happens. Um, you can see this as an example. So they have genes that were named things like SEPT1 or MARCH1 uh, and they were renamed so that they would not trigger uh, Microsoft Excel's um, date conversion. So what do I wanna say with this? Uh, I think using Microsoft Excel to uh, store and process your data is the equivalent of pipetting by mouth. Uh, it's not okay. It's really just not okay. Uh, Excel is very powerful and I respect that power. And there are things that are safe to do with it, but you have to work in a careful way. You gotta put on your hard hat and you have to use the pipette properly. So for example, primary data entry in Excel is okay if you use constraints on the cells and you use tests. Uh, but you've got to be conscientious about it because Excel loves to think for itself and convert your data and corrupt it. Um, but what you should absolutely never do as a professional researcher, because it's not professional conduct, uh, it's the equivalent of pipetting by mouth, is to process your data in Excel. You should be using code. Yeah, uh, that's what you do. You enter the data in Excel, you save it as comma separated values, and then you never open it in Excel again. Uh, and I know this sounds harsh. and Lots of people uh, say this when I tell them this, and I've been saying this for years, but it's simply not professional to use dangerous tools. Yes, it's convenient to pipette by mouth. It's quick, uh, and most of the time it'll be fine. Uh, but that doesn't make it professional, and that doesn't make it permissible. Stop using Excel. Okay, let's take a break um, and uh, go take a walk. Think about the things I've said, um, and when you come back, I'll still be here. Welcome back. Let's deal with the third part of uh, the horoscopes of this lecture, and that is reporting. Now, there are many aspects to reporting, but I'm just going to talk about five of them, uh, some in more detail than others. Uh, the first of these is sharing materials, and then I'll move on to talking about the various kinds of descriptions in reports, from the methods to the data to the results. And then finally, just a little bit, and way too little, about actually making decisions instead of simply describing uncertainty. Sharing materials uh, is extremely important and there's nothing that I'm gonna say here which is gonna surprise you. You can guess how I feel. Um, the paper is an advertisement. Uh, it is always too minimal for your colleagues to figure out exactly what was done. Uh, it, it, gives an outline of what was done, uh, and it gives um, a summary of the results, but no paper can be long enough and detailed enough so that your colleagues could actually repeat what you did or inspect the details uh, in enough detail so that they can really believe it. Um, the data and its analysis are your actual research products, and those need to be communicated someplace in full detail. And if you've done the version control that I talked about before the break, then congratulations, uh, it's all done for you. You nearly need to 
point your colleagues at the repository where the version control was done, and they can see the whole history of your project. Um, what this means in practice is quite simple, actually. If you work responsibly so that you're maintaining version control and testing as you go in your project and documenting as you go, by the time you have written your report, your paper, you're ready to share the project itself and not just the advertisement. Uh, and then it's a simply a matter of making the code and data available through a link uh, and not under any circumstances with this magic phrase, by request. As we all know what that means, that means you ain't gonna get it. Um, now, of course, some data are not shareable. I work in the human sciences. I'm very sympathetic with that. I work on many projects where the raw data cannot be shared. However, typically, a lot of detail about the data can be shared. Um, a synthetic version of the data can be shared so that your colleagues can verify that the analysis works as intended. Um, and the code can always be shared. And so that's a minimal uh, sort of circumstance so that any ambiguity in what was really done can be resolved through the code. And I've known a number of published papers where it only became clear what was done or what was not done uh, when we looked at the code itself. This is a very important thing to do. Sharing these materials also makes it possible for you and your colleagues to build on what you've done directly. It saves a lot of work, reduces a lot of uncertainty. So it helps research be cumulative. Um, and let's face it, before long, many, if not most, professional organizations are going to require archiving of code and data for all scientific projects, at least those that use public funding. Uh, and so you need to develop a way to satisfy these requirements now, not just because it's the only ethical thing to do, but soon it will be required. So describing methods. Uh, in this course, we've looked at a lot of statistical analyses and um, uh, I've described them in, in much more detail than you will typically be able to uh, devote to any of them in a paper, in a report. Now, this is one of the reasons, of course, that we provide the code because the code is the full documentation of your methods, at least the statistical processing part of your methods. Uh, but what you say in the paper is also important because you can uh, provide useful summaries of what was done. Uh, here's what I think of as my uh, list of minimal information that a report of a quantitative data analysis should have. And you may want to provide more than this, but again, I think of this as the minimum. The first would be somewhere, either in the main paper or in a supplement, the mass stats notation of the statistical model. I think this is necessary because uh, there's more here than in the code uh, in the sense that these mass stat notations have a grammar to them that's universal if you've learned it and it's software independent. Um, and so uh, future you or other people can rewrite, rewrite your model as intended in alternative software if you give them this statement. It'll be much harder to get this level of grammatical abstraction out of your code in most cases, because as you've learned in this course, for any one mass stats stat model, like the one on the right of this slide, there'll be multiple ways to program it, different kinds of parameterization, centered, non-centered, so on. Uh, so it may be the supplement, but better in, better in the main paper, because of course this is uh, your golem, and your golem is what's producing the estimate. Um, second, you want a clear explanation in the text of how this model provides your estimate, um, right? What, and this is going to reference in most cases some causal model and some logic about lack of confounding or identification of causal effects. Uh, third, you want to have a clear statement about what algorithm was used to produce the estimate for any given uh, statistical model. There are many different ways to pr produce useful estimates from it. In this class, we've used um, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, at least for the second half of the course, uh, to produce estimates. But in the first half of the course, we used a, an approximation of the posterior. There are yet other ways to do it, non-Bayesian ways, uh, and they're good too. Uh, but you just want it to be clear because sometimes choice of algorithm matters and affects um, the kinds of compromises. Fourth, uh, some statement about diagnostics and tests so that the readers know that you considered the possibility that the machine didn't work. Uh, 
uh, but that you've collected some diagnostics that are reassuring, if not foolproof, reassuring that it, the machine has functioned as intended. And then finally, um, it is uh, a professional uh, courtesy, uh, not yet a requirement, unfortunately, but at least a professional courtesy that you cite the software packages that you've used. It is a lot of work, I know, to write scientific software. It requires a lot of testing and use, and it becomes a full part of a person's job once they do it, just to maintain it. Uh, these people work real hard and they build foundations for the rest of us. Cite them, because if you don't cite them, they don't get professional credit, at least not if they're in, ac in academia. And without that professional credit, people will stop doing it. Cite the software. I want to give you um, a quick and boring, um, I'm afraid to say, but quick and boring and, and sufficient example of a methods paragraph that we might do for the social network model on the right of this slide. And I'll, I'll go through it uh, piece by piece and remind you what the function of each sentence is. So to begin, uh, to estimate the reciprocity within dyads, we model the correlation within dyads and giving using a multi-level mixed membership model. And then some textbook citation, meaning you will find some textbook, whether it's my own or somebody else's, or maybe a journal article which is specialized on, on mixed membership models um, that readers can follow up on to learn more about this kind of model. The purpose of this first statement is to say what we're trying to estimate, to remind the reader of that, and then the type of machine we're going to use to do it. To control for confounding from generalized giving and receiving, as indicated by the DAG in the previous section, we stratify giving and receiving by household. Uh, this is a statement of why we think this model gives us the estimate we want, because it's got a way to control for the confounding, which had been identified in a previous part of the paper. Uh, the full model with priors is presented at the right. We estimated the posterior distribution using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo as implemented in STAND version 2.29. Uh, and then you have a citation uh, to the STAND development team there as well. We validated the model on simulated data and assessed convergence by inspection of trace plots, R hat values, and effective sample sizes. This is where you're talking about diagnostics uh, to say that you um, uh, did check whether the chains worked at all. And then the diagnostics uh, for thoroughness are reported in Appendix B, and all results can be replicated using the code available at link. And then you have a link to some repository someplace or to a supplemental if the journal requires it that way. This is not, in any sense, uh, the model, because uh, there are other ways you could order uh, the information here. Uh, and some parts of this could certainly stand to be more thorough uh, than other parts. Um, and of course, there's, there's aspects of data processing, which you'd have to mention in other parts of the paper and so on. Uh, but I wanted to give you a template you can use uh, in your mind to at least think about um, something that would be uh, normative and sufficient in many fields. But if you're concerned about this and you're a bit confused about what information to provide, just imagine you were the reader and provide the information that you would like others to provide for you. So um, Bayesian models have priors, and this is a virtue. Uh, uh, priors do lots of useful things for us, uh, but we need to justify those priors, just like every other part of the model. And we spent a lot of time in this course doing that, uh, talking about how the constraints on variables um, uh, give us constraints on priors, and uh, how prior predictive simulation gives us a way to understand the implications of our prior and design useful priors that are not conditional on our data, but nevertheless, incorporate valid scientific constraints, pre-data constraints. Uh, you want to say something about this in your paper as well. Um, so for example, priors were chosen through prior predictive simulation so that pre-data predictions span the range of scientifically plausible outcomes. In the results, we explicitly compare the posterior distribution to the prior so that the impact of the sample is obvious. And I'm repeating on this slide on the right, an example from an earlier lecture, the second half of the Gaussian process lecture, where I explicitly compared the prior distribution for the Gaussian process kernel to uh, the posterior from uh, two different models. OK, now it's unfortunately true uh, that when you do statistics in the sciences, uh, 
uh, you will often get reviewers who don't know a lot about statistics but are extremely opinionated about it. This happens to everybody, so when it happens to you, congratulations, you're just like the rest of us. I wanted to say a little bit about this though, because in particular, when you start using uh, the sorts of models I've explained in this course, whether you're fitting them with Bayesian algorithms or not, uh, there is a class of reviewer who just doesn't like statistics and seems to have been taught at some point that if the, if the scientific study were good enough, it wouldn't need statistics or only the most minimal statistics at all. And they're just suspicious of complex stats. Uh, I had a reviewer once who actually wrote, good science doesn't need complex stats. This is a ridiculous statement. Uh, and it's worth being able to rebut this, uh, but you don't rebut it to the reviewer. You're not going to change the mind of a reviewer like this. You're talking to the editor. And what do you say to an editor when you get this kind of comment? Well, you say, look, uh, our causal model shows us that there is likely confounding uh, and that we need to stratify by variables A, B, and C. Um, and that requires statistical complexity. And so the statistical complexity is not something you've chosen ad hoc. It's something that's demanded from the scientific model itself. Uh, it's also true uh, these days a lot of us work with fairly large data sets, um, uh, uh, tens, hundreds, uh, thousands, a million records at a time. And when you have big data, uh, you have a lot more unit heterogeneity and a good analysis is going to deal with that unit heterogeneity in some way. That is, um, the scientific rigor that we can apply in big data sets is greater if we were just running the same simple linear regressions on a million records, we're wasting a lot of scientific opportunity. So again, this comes from the causal model. Unit heterogeneity is often uh, a competing cause or even a possible confound for inference, and we want to model that. And this requires statistical complexity as well, because you may have different kinds of units nested within one another in the model. Uh, furthermore, um, just because some simple statistical procedure can give us uh, the same kind of qualitative inference as a more complicated one, that doesn't mean we should use the simpler one. And why? Because the more complicated one typically is going to check for various problems and kinds of confounding and unit heterogeneity uh, that the simpler one will simply ignore. And you can get the right answer by being lucky uh, in science, but that's not a professional attitude, right? We need to justify uh, our answers. That is, knowledge is justified true belief, not just true belief. If you cannot justify the answer to our colleagues, it's not a result. So we have an ethical responsibility in research and data analysis to do the best thing we can. And if it turns out that doing the best thing we can, even though it's a little bit harder, gives us the same answer as the easy thing, that doesn't mean we did something wrong. It means we did something right. In any event, uh, if you remember nothing else from this little sermon here, uh, just remember that when you have reviewers um, that have uh, silly challenges to your statistical choices, uh, change the discussion from one about statistics uh, to about causal models. And that is good because it puts you on a stronger footing. You can justify your statistical procedures from a scientific position, not from just some arbitrary um, cultural place where people have been taught statistical rituals, uh, ways of reading tea leaves and cups, uh, things that cannot be justified uh, because they are essentially supernatural. So change the discussion always to scientific models, to causal models, and proceed forward again from there. As I said before, you're, you're writing for the editor and not the reviewer. And uh, this helps a lot in my experience. And one of the things in writing to the editor is that the editor has an interest, at least a good editor does, in the whole field and the uh, comprehensibility of the papers that will be in their journal. So it can often help to persuade an editor that your analysis uh, makes sense both for the topic and their journal if you find other papers in the discipline or that very journal that have used Bayesian methods or similar models, even if they're Bayesian or not. Uh, when you uh, explain your results, you're likely to have a lot of readers who are not so familiar with Bayesian statistics. That's fine. They're good people. Um, but you can explain the results in ways that avoid confusion. And what I mean by that is don't use non-Bayesian terminology. Uh, don't use the word significant, for example. Uh, 
Explain the results in Bayesian terms with all the uncertainty. And one of the easiest ways to do this is simply show posterior densities uh, instead of intervals. And this avoids a lot of problems. It doesn't mean the readers will understand everything, but they'll avoid some uh, all too easy misunderstandings. And that's, uh, that's something worth uh, achieving. One of the things you can do to help curious readers is give them some place to go to read a bit more. And almost every scientific discipline now, I should say every scientific discipline, has some good papers written for people in that discipline about Bayesian statistics and how it's useful in their field. Uh, and so you probably know one already for your field, and that's what you should be citing. Um, when you say, you know, readers who are unfamiliar, uh, please go read this, because it's not the job of your paper to teach people Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics is entirely normative. It's a mainstream way of doing data analysis in the sciences and in industry and in government. Uh, uh, you don't need to justify it necessarily, but you probably do need to help people a bit who are unfamiliar with it. It's the same sense in which if you use calculus in a paper, it's not fair for a reviewer or an editor to object to the use of calculus because the readers are unfamiliar with it. Calculus is the right tool. Likewise, if you use Bayesian statistics, uh, uh, just because some reader uh, is unfamiliar with it, that's not a legitimate objection. Um, Bayes, I say, is ancient. It's hundreds of years old. It's normative. Um, and, and in practical matters, for complex multi-level models, it's really the only practical way for individual researchers to estimate those models in the first place. Okay, a little bit about describing data. This will be less involved. So uh, sample size by itself is not a lot of information. People like to talk about big data, meaning there are lots of records, but the structure of those records is really important for how people interpret your study because it affects the kind of, well, uh, statistical information in the data. Consider a really extreme contrast. Um, say a data set that has a thousand records, uh, but they all are from one person versus an equivalently sized data set which has one observation from a thousand different people. These are very different data sets. Each of them has a sample size of a thousand. Uh, so what can you do? Well, describe this structure. Uh, and what you're trying to do is get across in a heuristic way a concept like the effective sample size uh, for your study, which is a function uh, both of your estimate, what you're trying to learn, and the hierarchical structure of the data, how many units, how much variation there is among them, and how many observations per unit. Um, you can communicate this uh, to your readers very efficiently by simply describing that cluster structure and how many uh, observations are, are available for each cluster or how much the observations vary across clusters. Um, it can be useful to say as well for particular variables at which level of the data hierarchy they're measured. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, commonly, there are some variables which are only measured for the whole cluster, all right? and they're invariant across all observations in that cluster. Uh, but there'll be other variables that are measured at the micro level uh, within clusters and therefore vary within clusters. Um, and this information is very important because it changes the way we think about the model and the kinds of inferences that can be made. Finally, missing values. <clears throat> many, many studies uh, never mention that there are missing values in the data, but of course there are. And the software automatically drops all the cases containing missing values, and this is never mentioned either. Uh, you have to tell your reader how many missing values there are, which variables have them, and how you've treated the missing values and justify it causally. Okay, describing results. Uh, I could do an entire 10 week course just on describing results. So uh, apologies for, for boiling it down to just a couple slides here. Um, the focus of your results in, in a typical scientific study, of course there are going to be useful exceptions, but in a typical study, the focus are your estimates and those are to be presented in an orthodox fashion using marginal causal effects. And I've given you a number of examples in this course of how to compute those and what they mean conceptually. Um, it can also be very useful when you're describing your results to warn the readers against causal interpretation of control variables. Remember the table two fallacy. Quite often control variables cannot be interpreted causally. They may be confounded or they may be only partial causal effects and therefore they're not useful scientifically for the purposes of the paper. Um, when summarizing effects and visualizing them, densities are better than intervals. Uh, uh, why? 
Well, intervals um, have arbitrary boundaries. Uh, they're just visual guides. There's nothing, and nothing special happens at the end of the interval. But readers will often think that something magical happens there, like the estimate becomes significant, or if the interval contains zero, then it's not robust, and other kinds of illogical superstitions. Uh, if you draw densities, um, people can still uh, engage in the acrobatics of seeing if the density includes zero, but there's no arbitrary boundary, and it becomes visually obvious that there's just a gradual change in probability um, as you move from the middle to the outside of any posterior distribution. Even better than densities quite often are sample realizations. So uh, when the posterior distribution contains whole functions, not just uh, singular scalar values, um, then drawing realizations of those functions from the posterior distribution, that is regression lines or curves or splines or social networks, as you see animating on the right of this slide, uh, uh, drawing multiple realizations from the posterior communicates the uncertainty often much better than trying to draw some density because you get to see the shape of each individual realization and that communicates a lot more information. Keep in mind always that the point of scientific figures is to help your readers make comparisons. And so you design them for the comparisons of interest. There's a huge amount to say about that. I just wanna give you a couple of guides. I think like with lots of things in research, one of the ways to get better at it is to read other people's stuff. Um, <clears throat> so uh, some of the most interesting work on visualization that I come across recently is from Jessica Holman and colleagues. Uh, here's a paper I recommend to you on sample realizations, uh, looking at how uh, uh, presentation of uh, variability um, uh, from what they call hypothetical outcome plots, which are like draws from the posterior, uh, that people interpret these more accurately, that they understand the uncertainty better using these hypothetical outcome plots you can see in the figure on the slide. Um, and this is an empirical literature. I think that's what's great about this is that they're not just philosophizing about data presentation, but they're testing it out on people and seeing the accuracy of the impressions that people get. Uh, and then on the right, there's a book I recommend to you. Um, one of the ways to make better visualizations is to uh, analyze bad ones. Uh, and here's a, here's a nice book, uh, entertaining examples, um, both from uh, research and uh, the public sphere uh, by Alberto Cairo, uh, the, both good and bad charts, uh, how charts lie. And there are lots of books in this area as well that you might find useful. Okay, just a little bit about making decisions. Uh, in this course, I've avoided as much as possible making decisions about the analyses, meaning when we got the estimate at the end, there was nothing to do with it. It was a basic research question. It's the way I've always presented it. Um, occasionally, I talked about interventions, uh, like in the case of the admissions data. Um, but for the most part, I've avoided the swamp, which is actually doing something with statistics once you've got the answers. Uh, this is a big and important area of work, and I just want to give you a little bit of a, a, a flag in the sand about it here. So in most academic research, the point of your report is to communicate the uncertainty. You're postponing uh, a decision because you want to allow your colleagues to make their own minds up about what your results mean. You may give them suggestions about what you think they mean, but you need to give them as much information as possible that they can make up their own minds. Uh, in industry, however, and in some parts of applied academic research as well, instead the goal of the report is to say what we should do now that we have uh, estimates from the model. And this requires some additional steps. And what I want to say here is that um, producing the posterior distribution is much easier than then deciding what to do with it. Uh, there are additional problems uh, in this area as well. Uh, for example, uh, you might have a boss uh, who really doesn't tolerate uncertainty, doesn't understand statistics, and doesn't want to hear any wishy-washy language about, um, uh, about not being sure what's going on or what to do. Uh, and this happens uh, uh, some, some of my colleagues and acquaintances in business uh, where their bosses really just uh, interpret any sort of acknowledgement of uncertainty as an admission of weakness. Uh, but as analysts, we know that's not true. Uh, um, admitting uncertainty is, is a strength but we need to have a way to use that uncertainty to make decisions, 
because we have to make decisions. <clears throat> the field of Bayesian decision theory, uh, again, this is one of these topics that could be its own 10-week course. Uh, this is a big field. And if you Google that phrase, you'll find lots of helpful things uh, about it. There are many books um, uh, uh, and online guides and many, many papers. The basic intuition is that um, the additional thing we need to do to make decisions uh, after, after running a Bayesian model is to state the costs and benefits of the various outcomes that, that could come from the generative process as, we, as we've estimated it. And then uh, we use, using the uncertainty in the posterior distribution, we compute the posterior benefits of any particular hypothetical policy choice. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you can think about a policy choice as an intervention. So if you have a causal model and you've, you've uh, uh, defined your estimate and you now have an estimate in the form of a posterior distribution, you can run simulated policy interventions and then you will get simulated outcome distributions for those interventions. And then because you're mapping outcomes to costs and benefits, you can get posterior distributions uh, from your interventions of the costs and benefits uh, of those interventions. Sounds complicated. There's a simple example in chapter three uh, which will, will prime your imagination a bit about it. And if, as I said, if you're interested in more, there are lots of examples uh, that you can find uh, by searching for Bayesian decision theory. This is a very um, uh, flexible sort of approach. It, it mixes and matches with uh, lots of complex techniques. For example, it can be integrated with dynamic optimization uh, techniques as well. Uh, uh, it can, you can do this because uh, a generative Bayesian model is a generative model. And so uh, it, it contains uncertainty, but then that can be folded into uh, other sorts of, of procedures that don't usually uh, admit uncertainty. Uh, you just get posterior distributions of outcomes from them, multiple realizations, remember. Uh, and then uh, you can proceed making um, uh, choices that achieve uh, the benefits uh, and avoid the costs that you're interested in. There's a lot of detail here uh, in a horoscope lecture that I can't get into, um, but of course, in the weeds of these problems, you have to decide exactly how the costs and benefits matter. And the only thing I wanna say about that, just to warn you, is that usually in human affairs, we're not interested in maximizing instantaneous costs and benefits from a single intervention, but rather some flow from the growth or, of some stock and uh, or avoiding some particular disastrous outcome like extinction of a species and so you need that's what goes into your costs and benefits and it's scientifically tailored sorts of, of costs and benefits okay i've been talking a lot about science here and really i think you get a sense that what i'm talking about in this lecture is scientific reform that there are lots of things about the sciences which are kind of reckless uh, and a little bit dangerous. There's science in the background. Um, and while we're spending all this time talking about science reform, science keeps going on crashing. Uh, what can be done uh, to put the brakes on this thing? Well, I don't have any good answers there, but I think one of the first conceptual things we have to do is recognize that a lot of what goes on in the development of scientific methods and statistical traditions is not logical. It's institutional and sociological. It arises from population level processes of cultural evolution because scientists are members of a community and most of them really don't understand the structure of that community in any detailed way. They're participants in it. So here's the most cartoonish model of science that I know. It's one that I've published. Uh, and in this cartoonish model, um, uh, our little uh, mythological scientist first uh, chooses some hypothesis to test. And uh, uh, there are both novel hypotheses, they innovate on their own. And then there are also hypotheses in the literature they might uh, select to try and replicate or do some follow up on. Uh, and then they design a study and investigation from this. And there's some result that arises from the details of their investigation and, and their statistical procedures, the way they process the data. Then they write a report and it goes into peer review and it suffers some fate uh, if they choose to submit it, of course, because uh, as we know, many negative results are never even submitted for peer review. They're simply flushed or filed 
uh, away forever. Uh, uh, as we all know, different kinds of results receive uh, different probabilities of being communicated to the scientific public, uh, to the scientific community, and also to the public. Uh, all of these are processes which contain uh, both virtue and, well, uh, the opposite of virtue. I don't want to say evil, but biases, things that distort um, uh, what we're learning about nature. Uh, that is to say, one thing that you can you can imagine is that no matter how hard we work on our statistical procedures to perfect them, uh, to get all the bias out of them, uh, these other processes, uh, the ways in which we select our hypotheses and the ways in which our results are communicated or not, uh, put bias back in the system. And since follow-up investigations depend upon what's in the scientific literature, the whole thing can be biased in very powerful ways. Uh, now, I said this was a cartoon model. Real science is not like this uh, in any detailed sense, but it, it's a caricature that captures some important aspects. And even a simple model like this can produce lots of illogical and negative things that happen in research communities. Um, here's a real thing about research that I think is interesting and can actually be explained by really simple cartoonish models of the sociology of science. Uh, so this is a paper that came out in 2021. And what the authors did is they looked at papers in three different uh, uh, broad disciplines, uh, nature, uh, science, uh, uh, papers published in nature and science on the left, if that's a discipline, um, I guess it's a glory seeking discipline. Uh, then papers in economics journals in the middle, and then uh, psychology papers uh, that were included in the what's called the replication markets. And, um, and what they did in each of these is they looked at papers that were eventually uh, have been a, where people attempted to replicate them and either failed or succeeded. So the, the black trends are cases where people attempted to replicate these things uh, at some point and uh, they failed to do so. And so the result is now called into question. We don't know its status. It's not necessarily false, um, uh, but that so far people have not been able to repeat the original result. And then the blue trends are papers where um, the averages of papers where they were eventually replicated. Uh, people have been able to repeat the results in, in many cases, multiple times. Um, and you see in each of these uh, broad disciplines, broad categories that the papers that were eventually not replicated have enjoyed higher citation counts year after year since the, since the time of their publication. Um, and even after the point, the vertical black line there is the point at which the replication was attempted uh, for each paper. And you'll see even after the failed replications, uh, uh, we don't know for nature science yet there, but for the case of economics and the psychology replication markets, the, the papers that have failed to replicate still enjoy higher citation rates. Uh, than those that have been replicated. This is a little bit, well, disappointing. Yeah, we would like a scientific literature in which the most popular papers, the ones that are cited the most, are also the most reliable papers. But this does not appear to be the science that we have. Maybe it's the science we deserve, but it's not the science we have. What explains this phenomenon? There are lots of different causal processes uh, that could produce this. That's the first thing I want to assert. Science is at least as complicated as any statistical analysis you're going to do, and it's going to have collider bias and selection biases and confounds and all the other stuff that makes it difficult to interpret empirical patterns like the one on the screen. But let me give you one possible explanation um, to prime your imagination, and it uses some of the tools you've learned in this course. This is a, an example that's actually from the book on page 162. So imagine we have 200 papers or, or grant proposals um, that vary along two dimensions. The first on the horizontal here is their newsworthiness, uh, which means um, how much public interest and public importance uh, the result will have. Uh, that could be its potential for patents uh, or, or just how much it, it thrills the public. Um, because thrilling the public is, of course, um, a service that research can provide, uh, right? Entertainment is a service. It increases human welfare. Um, uh, just knowing about nature uh, increases human welfare, right? Even if it's of no economic use. Uh, and then the other dimension is the trustworthiness of the result. And you can think of this as the extent to which um, the, the result is reliable, that the methods are good, and that if it was, uh, if the study was uh, inspected in a detailed logical way, uh, 
um, it would turn out to be the correct result. Or if it, someone attempted to replicate it, uh, in this case, uh, whether it would be likely to replicate. And I'm going to assume that these two dimensions are completely unrelated to one another. So I've randomly drawn 200 papers where there's no correlation between newsworthiness and trustworthiness at the level of the individual paper or proposal. But now suppose the uh, journal uh, selects only the top 10%, and they do so through some additive combination of the two dimensions. They subjectively rate the newsworthiness and trustworthiness of each uh, paper, um, and then the top 10% shown in red here uh, are accepted. And now what you can see, even though there's no correlation in the overall population of papers and proposals, there's a strong negative correlation uh, in the papers we see. Remember, we don't see the submissions. We only see the ones that make it through the bottleneck. We see the accepted papers in red. And in that population, the published papers, there's a negative correlation between newsworthiness and trustworthiness, just like we saw in that 2021 study. There's the papers that are the most exciting, the most far to the right uh, on this, are the least trustworthy, the least likely to replicate. And the ones that are least newsworthy on the left at the top of this graph are the most trustworthy. But it's a side effect of selection, uh, about the bottleneck of how papers are chosen to be communicated. And of course, uh, that tickle uh, uh, in your spine is a collider. Uh, this is a result, an example of collider bias. So um, think of this little causal graph on the right of this slide. There are two causes uh, the, by which uh, that influence whether a paper is published uh, in this example, newsworthiness and trustworthiness. Um, and so when we condition on publication, that is, we only see the red papers here, uh, that means conditioning or selecting on publication, we're conditioning on a collider. And that induces an association, a strong negative association in this case, between newsworthiness and trustworthiness. But it's a non-causal effect. Uh, this is not evidence um, that uh, more newsworthy papers are actually worse in the work uh, when they're produced. Yeah, these, these, these features could be completely unrelated to one another inside laboratories, inside offices. Uh, but then at the population level, they end up having a, a disassociation with one another through the process of publication. That doesn't mean it's okay, but it completely changes the kind of intervention we might do. Uh, and I hope you see that. So my point is, we've got to be careful. Uh, if we want to stop the crashing car uh, of science as we talk about it, um, we've got to choose our interventions quite carefully here. Uh, the truth is that no one really knows how research works. It's a very complicated thing. Uh, every piece of it is complicated, and we spend majorities of our careers just figuring out those pieces. Um, and the, the science of research is really in its infancy. Um, if I was going to offer you some final horoscopes in this lecture, uh, horoscopes about research as a whole, as a set of institutions and a culturally evolving process, I would say that there are some easy fixes, though, which are uh, unlikely to do significant harm and quite likely to do significant good. Um, the first is that we should not be doing any statistics at all without some transparently communicated causal model that justifies the statistical analysis and the estimates. Um, this allows more open criticism, and it just for ourselves, it helps us debug our own thinking while we're producing the study itself. Uh, too often, uh, statistics in the sciences is just causal salad. It's just a bunch of variables, and they're thrown into some machine. Some coefficients come out, and those coefficients are given a causal interpretation. This must stop. It is never acceptable. Two, it's reasonable as a set of professional standards to insist that we prove that our code works, at least in principle. Of course, we can't be sure that we get the right answer from any research project. Uh, that's why research is fun. But we can be sure that in the closed logical world of our code and our synthetic data simulation, that the pieces fit together and produce the kind of desired answer we're looking for. So we can prove our code works in principle. Three, we can share as much as possible. Uh, I say as possible because, again, I work in the human sciences. There are many reasons that you cannot share data. Uh, it will always be the case 
Um, but there are lots of things that can be shared. And I think a majority of the benefits of sharing come from sharing a little bit. Uh, that is the code and just uh, some partial set of the data set so that people understand uh, what has gone on or just even a synthetic data set is a huge help. But often we can do a lot more. Even if we can't publicly share the data, we can provide a way for our colleagues to inspect it privately as is done with medical databases. Uh, fourth, beware proxies of research quality like citation count. Uh, I, I hope I've convinced you that there are many plausible ways in which proxies can become distorted by uh, bottlenecks and, and uh, endogenous collider selection and the like. Um, if we're judging one another's contributions uh, through proxies rather than through the rigor of the work and the logical uh, tr uh, workflows from the causal models to the methods to how the results are presented, then we're doing a disservice to our colleagues and also to ourselves. I want you to keep in mind here that, that uh, these are just horoscopes. Um, they're vague. And so in any particular case, you're going to be able to do better and make better suggestions. Uh, but I tried to uh, select four things that I thought could apply to most of the sciences and most research in industry as well. Um, in terms of doing more and going beyond horoscopes, uh, what I would say, uh, and this is a hopeful message, is that many of the things you dislike about academia or about research and industry, if that's where you are, is that most of those things were once well-intentioned reforms. Uh, people thought that impact factor was a good innovation, that it would be an objective way to compare journals, but has turned out to be a nightmare. So we should be careful what we wish for and think carefully about impacts. And yes, use theory and analysis to think about policy proposals for research using research itself. Thanks for your attention. I hope you've found some value in this course. I've really enjoyed teaching it. I'll see you next year.